So hello everybody, thank you for uh, being here. At first, I would like to briefly introduce the interdisciplinary field of animal studies and then to review uh, current empirical research as well as some of the uh, philosophical discussions about ethics. And I'm going to pay special attention to animal rights, which are also the main focus of this conference. So first, uh, just a few, a uh, few info about the field itself. So animal studies is a relatively new field with, within humanities, and it focuses on the relationship between humans and non-human animals. The field is sometimes uh, called also human animal studies, uh, but this name was later criticized uh, because it emphasized uh, the binary between humans and other animals. And therefore, uh, some scholars, including me, uh, prefer to use just animal studies. Um, animal studies is uh, not uh, the study of animals per se, like in natural science. Rather, it focuses on the interactions between humans uh, and other animals. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary field. It means that it uh, contains uh, studies uh, from uh, sociology, uh, psychology, history, law, religion, uh, and several other disciplines like philosophy, for example. Uh, this, this, is, uh, this discipline have its, uh, has its parallel in the animal rights movement, so that's where it has roots. And it's very similar to uh, gender studies, which have, uh, has roots in, uh, in uh, feminism or African American studies, uh, which are rooted in civil rights movement. Yeah, so animal studies has arisen parallel to the animal protection or animal rights movement. And the, the most important uh, books uh, for this field, uh, or like the first uh, important publication, which sparked interest were uh, Peter Singer's Animal Liberation from 1975, followed by Tom Regan's The Case for Animal Rights in 1983. And so these uh, two books are considered as very important because it, uh, they led to an explosion of interest in animals among not only animal advocates uh, or the general public, but academics as well, because academics are also part of the public, of course, and some of them are activists as well. Uh huh. Like alarm clock. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, there is some some problem with sound. Yeah. So wait a minute. Okay, what about now? Is it better? It's still there. I'm sorry, I don't know where it comes from. I put in different microphone. Okay, thank you, thank you, I'm sorry. So that was uh, the roots. Okay, I continue. Okay, now it seems stuck. Okay. Okay. Uh, although animal studies uh, can be studied as a relatively uh, descriptive field, which only reflects animals in human society without the critical reflection. Some scholars uh, call it value free. The most relevant uh, subfield for this conference is called critical animal studies. 
uh, academics within this subfield uh, want to eliminate the domination and oppression of animals, humans included, that's important, and also to transform higher education into a more inclusive environment uh, for considering all species. And uh, critical animal studies constitute the first academic field to advocate for dismantling of the animal industrial complex and for veganism. Uh, as I promised earlier, uh, now I would like to introduce current empirical research as well as actual philosophical discussions about ethics. Of course, it's not going to be uh, all embracing review, but rather uh, my brief overview of the several, several topics which I consider uh, to be the most relevant to this conference. So, for example, like veganism, eating, me eating meat or animal rights and liberation also i focused on the publications from the last five years with one exception next so one of the uh, current topics are opportunities and barriers of spreading spreading veganism as a part of animal rights movement so far research has mostly identified personal barriers related to individuals' personal characteristics, attitudes, and beliefs. Uh, for, for example, uh, enjoying the taste of meat, you know, rationalizations like this, viewing meat eating as masculine behavior, denying that animals suffer, and so on. But the authors of the study from Kent State University in the US uh, sus suspected that there might be also social barrier to dietary change, fear of stigmatization. So the authors hypo hypothesized that anticipating this so-called vegan stigma and the consequent loss of friendships and exclusion from social activities might discourage people from going vegan. Uh, other researchers uh, found that exclusion and disapproval uh, can at least partially be explained by uh, so-called communal uh, food hypothesis. So communal food hypothesis stress the importance of our need to share food with friends and family. Uh, the fear of being rejected or disliked by other people uh, as vegan is unfortunately based in reality because research of University of Arizona revealed that the general public has a negative view of veganism and vegans. Furthermore, uh, using the word vegan and vegetarian in the name of meatless food dish can sometimes have a negative effect on how the consumer perceive the food. The thing which I already noticed when we have the free food samplings that people, when it's labeled vegan, they are sometimes uh, <laughs> fear to try. Um, another article examines institutional resistance to veganism uh, within the medical system. So author argues that the vegan body is socially constructed as a deviant entity by medical professionals. Uh, the, the research was conducted in Estonia, but I think it's pretty valid for the whole Europe, I bet, but of course we don't have that data. So she suggests that the medical professionals perceptions of vegans are based less on the actual conditions of their bodies, but more on ideas about them and their prejudice about them. So the experiences of vegans in the medical system illuminate the role of powerful social institutions in resisting any transition in society, and especially this one. It's uh, also good to note that the stigma of being vegan is often much stronger for vegans who are members of uh, marginalized groups. Uh, therefore, I would like to mention another study which uh, focused on uh, the experiences of vegans of color and how they deal with the white and privileged image of veganism. And most of the participants in this uh, study said that race did not affect their decision to go vegan, but respondents noted that their families saw veganism as a rejection of their culture, 
because they could not eat the food uh, of their families, which can be very insulting and it can cause this fear of losing uh, the roots, losing the heritage of ancestors. And uh, this was not an issue for white people because they usually do not feel the need to preserve their culture as, for example, uh, recent uh, immigrants do. And other scholars have looked more closely at the experiences of fat vegans. So they highlighted that so-called fat phobia and the politic, uh, politics of uh, diet can create a hostile environment for some people in the movement. Uh, so to sum up these two slides, um, uh, we could uh, achieve, according to at least these conclusions of these studies, we could achieve positive behavior changes much more easily if instead of stigma, um, support for vegans was common and present among family and friends course, how to achieve that, right? Uh, these studies highlight how important social support is, especially for potential new adopters and for already marginalized people in our movement. So therefore, it's very important to create these like support groups where people can meet that they are, for example, alone in some small city in small town and help them to meet each other because the social support is uh, very important because people are social animals. Although more and more people are adopting uh, uh, plant-based diets and veganism, as I already mentioned, uh, there appears to be some resentment towards vegans and vegetarians. And uh, you might experience it by yourself, you know, that might range from ridicule on social media sites, those jokes like nobody likes a vegetarian, uh, to bumper stickers like this one, you know, vegetarian is an old Indian word for bed hunter. And in fact, uh, there also has been a term coined for this resentment, and it was called vegophobia. So what is it about vegans that is so annoying, according to uh, at least this data? So a reason why vegetarians and vegans can become a target of this uh, negativity, maybe thanks to their sometimes overly moral beha behavior, while others may deem plant-based eaters to be snobbish and elitist. Uh, Kara mentions, for example, uh, an ad from PETA, which suggested that feeding kids meat is child abuse. Uh, at the same time, such advertisements may attract attention, media attention, which is very important, the use of uh, strong guilt in messaging like this may also backfire, like in vegan phobia. Another source of annoyance may, may be uh, the so-called militant vegan who uses tactics of intimidation, such as the vegan activist who splashes fake blood on French pastors display. Um, the last mentioned reason is the way how some people reduce negative feelings from perceiving killing of animals. That may be the most important part. As Kara points out, when exposed to the plight of animal suffering, many people get upset and we wish for the cruelty uh, to end. But, there is big but, there is a risk that such communications will foster negative attitudes toward the message sender as well. So they don't blame uh, the system or animal industrial complex, but they blame the person who is carrying the message. And it works you know, also in other topics as well, in environmental crisis and so on. So this um, uh, blaming message sender is also effective way how to reduce feelings of guilt. Much easier than actually changing the whole way of living. Yeah. Another area of research deals with the effectivity of different types of animal rights activism. As we know, animal rights activists uh, regularly use visual communication to get uh, their message to the public. Uh, explicit uh, violent images are considered as very potent tool to bridge the moral gap between activists and between the audiences. Um, however, 
there is a strong debate regarding the effectiveness of different visuals. For example, Fernandez conducted the review of the actual research about the effectiveness of showing graphic images and about inducing so-called moral shock. Uh, according to her, a relevant number of findings show a positive correlation between moral shock or explicit violent images and positive change in the field of animal advocacy. However, using the moral shock involves some dangers and risks. For example, uh, horrible images with violence can make people look away because it's too difficult to handle. Atula also mentions that showing violent uh, images can lead to desensitizing and to normalizing violence. And also it can lead to so-called compassion fatigue generated in the audience. In other words, that audience can lose the ability to care about suffering because it's too much. So our mind blocks uh, this feeling in order to protect our psychological health. So that's, that's where it can backfire. Uh, Fernandez and Atala know that it's, it's possible to use moral shock but only when certain conditions are met. So according to Fernandez, it's necessary to find effective frames to explain these experiences of uh, non-human animal suffering. She recommends frames that emphasize animal personhood, individuality, um, senti sentience, and complex emotions, also in positive and non-violent ways. Uh, for example, um, images of non-human animals that live in animal sanctuaries where they can live happily, you know, without uh, fear of being killed. These images, these positive images, let us imagine how the absence of fear and suffering might feel. And it allows us to open to also the other side. Yeah, so to see the, if, if we can see also the positive example, like how we can treat the animals, it's for us uh, more uh, possible to accept also the horrible reality or accept actually bearing, bearing witness. Okay, and Atola claims that it's useful to promote action in response to the realities shown in those images. So people can actually do something about that. So they don't feel powerless when they are exposed to those uh, violent images. Also, it is good idea, according to her, to announce the explicit content of images when possible, especially when people in the audience struggle to manage the emotions triggered by the images, especially children. Yeah, and it's also much more effective when it's uh, voluntary, yeah, when they are not forced to watch it. Yeah. Uh, regarding promoting veganism, it's worth to mention study of Gruen and Jones, who claim that vegan living is, at least in their head, impossible for most current consumers in industrialized societies. So even though it might not be true in their head, it's really something which is impossible. It's nothing like they wake up and choose different type of tea. So these authors argue that instead of discussing veganism as identity or lifestyle, it's according to them better to think of veganism as a non-idealized aspiration, like some ideal where people like trying to achieve. And so it's not a reduce, reduce starianism, uh, like uh, allowing people like, okay, you can have just meat once a week and that's okay, but like going to the goal, but it's okay to be on the, on the way. So avoiding identity of moral purity or even vegan superiority, according to these authors, increase the likelihood that non-vegans will be open to embracing uh, the non-violence non that grounds veganism. Okay, so next, next, uh, next fruitful area of research deals with the psychology of eating meat, which is closely related to promoting veganism. And those informations are very important for us 
in order to understand why people eat other animals and uh, how to explain many paradoxes in this area. So st studies reveal that the most people do not like causing pain or death to animals. Yet at the same time, uh, many purchase and consume meat, this process that causes uh, suffering and premature death to animals. In order to overcome this contradiction, people may dissociate meat from animals, you know, and they do it by ignoring or suppressing the knowledge that the meat on their plates originated from once living creature. Australian, uh, Australian psychologist Steve Lunen conducted a series of interesting experiments and uh, he came to conclusion that people seem to alleviate unpleasant feeling about eating meat by diminishing the minds of animals which are eaten and he called it meat paradox. The, the experiment was quite interesting. He, uh, he, he signed people into uh, groups um, and then he gave one group uh, some uh, cow's meat, some beef, and the other group nuts. Both groups were carnists, like classical meat eaters, but the group who ate nuts uh, were more open to admit that cows have emotions, intelligence, and so on. Yeah, people who actually ate the beef or cow's meat, uh, for them it was more difficult. So they denied the mind of animals in order to reduce what's in psychology called cognitive dissonance. Yeah, so that, that's the explanation uh, why people in our society tend to see farm animals as stupid, non-emotional or dirty or in, you know, non, uh, in some other way uh, inferior. Uh, another study provides the comprehensive test of this uh, hypothesis of meat paradox. Um, and this study highlights uh, underlying psychological mechanisms such as uh, dissociation. Yeah. And here are, you can see the main results. So they offered participants uh, different types of meat. Sometimes it was uh, processed meat, sometimes it was uh, whole, not unprocessed meat, sometimes it was meat where the head of the animal was present, sometimes was without head. And also in some cases, they present them some eggs with living animals. So they actually could see the cow right before they ate the cow. And also they compared how the language affect the, uh, the consumption of animals. Yeah, so, uh, so these are the results. So processed meat, so processed meat like sausage or you know, ground meat, made participants less empathetic towards the slaughtered animal uh, than in un unprocessed meat. When beheaded, a whole roasted pork evoked less empathy and disgust than when uh, the head was actually present. Conversely, presenting a living animal in a meat advertisement increased empathy and reduced willingness to actually eat that meat. Um, Next, uh, uh, next point is related to using language. So describing industrial meat production as harvesting versus killing or slaughtering indirectly reduced empathy. And last influence of the, of the language they mention is uh, how you call the meat itself. Yeah, so replacing pork beef label with pig cow label in a restaurant menu increased empathy and disgust disgust which both equally reduced the willingness to eat meat and at the same time uh, logically increased willing willingness to choose an alternative vegetarian dish so people usually need to be motivated to actually try to have courage to try the alternative dish Okay, and the last area I want to mention is philosophy and ethical philosophy. 
So the philosophers who started the modern movement agree on the goal, but they differ in their approach. So deontologists like Tom Regan, they argue that rearing animals for food infringes animals' inherent right to life. So we should not cause suffering to those individuals which we consider to be subject of a life. Yeah, so there are some characteristics what they need to have. Uh, and then if they have this characteristic that we have to, we cannot kill them in any way. We cannot even <clears throat> use them uh, for some greater good. Utilitarians, uh, utilitarians claim that ending the use of animals for food will result in the maximization of utility and reducing animal suffering. Yeah, so uh, they balance the suffering. So for example, they sometimes can cause suffering if it helps much more other individuals. And despite their different approaches, uh, arguments have a common step. They, they move from the no notion of suffering to the conclusion of uh, veganism. Uh, in the paper from uh, last year, uh, Alvaro suggests that the notion of animal suffering is uh, not necessary in order to condemn the practice of animal farming. So he, pro he proposed the possibility of defending veganism on the basis of uh, arguments that do not rest just on the notion of animal suffering, but rather rely on aesthetic principles, the avoidance of violence. So even though the suffering is not presented, it's still a violent act to kill somebody who does not want to die, and preservation of the environment and also health. Um, the last paper I want to mention is dedicated to animal liberation as a moral duty. So authors of this paper from 2018 uh, note that when non-human animals escape imminent slaughter at the hands of humans, they usually became celebrities. So people usually want them to be free, they, uh, they are a fan of them. And it might also sound paradoxical, uh, like if other animals would not want liberation too, like other animals who are waiting in slaughterhouse, but never mind. So despite this, despite that the audience is usually in, uh, wants, uh, wants to liberate animals, uh, popular culture is saturated with narratives that reinforce the binary of us versus them us as humans versus them, animals which should be in a place to, to serve us. So when a non-human escapes, humans must hunt down him or her to restore the human's sense of order. Furthermore, uh, news articles often refer to cases of animals seeking uh, their own liberation from zoos, slaughterhouses, and other types of enclosures as jailbreaks using uh, the language which suggests criminality. So the discourse is clear. Non-humans are uh, the criminals uh, for attempting freedom despite uh, committing no crime, just not being where humans want them to have. So Ellen and Essen argue that animals are agents of resistance and as such, humans are responsible for the abolition of captivity and uh, promotion of non-return policies. So uh, at least when animal escape, that we should not have right to keep them back or if they are not possible to take care of themselves or so put them in some uh, sanctuary. So humans, according to them, should recognize non-human status as active resistors to captivity. Okay, so those were the topics and uh, research uh, which I wanted to mention. And now I would like to share with you some links, useful links, if in case some of you were interested in animal studies and uh, would like to read uh, the research uh, from this field, or uh, even better to start to, to be part of that, uh, of that subfield. 
and actually so maybe you are scholars from some disciplines of humanities and uh, this uh, this area is uh, very fruitful and it's getting more and more important so here is some list of the organizations uh, first is European Association for Critical Animal Studies, uh, which I um, co-founded and uh, it organized every two or three years uh, conference uh, every time in different uh, place in Europe. Maybe it will go online in the future, we will see. Uh, the, North, the second from the from US is North American Association for Critical Animal Studies, which is the sister, sister organization of European One. Then the third is the oldest organization uh, in this uh, critical subfield. It's called the Institute for Critical Animal Studies, and it's also mainly located in United uh, United uh, States. Uh, then also another even older organization is called Animals and Society Institute. It's uh, not uh, the critical subfield. So it's uh, more like human animal studies, it's descriptive, usually. Uh, then I would like to mention Center for Human Animal Studies, which is located in the UK. And it also organized some uh, conferences time to time. And International Society for Anthrozoology. Um, uh, that's uh, focused mostly on anthropology, but also other disciplines. Okay, and uh, here are some useful links uh, to academic networks. So it's very useful when you would like to be active. Uh, uh, it's good to be in touch with other academics, to share, you know, ideas for research or some results of the research, uh, or you know, collaborate. It's a great place to find somebody from different country to create international research, which is uh, very useful. So first, uh, networks uh, by the already mentioned European Association for Critical Animal Studies. So we have a Facebook group, uh, we have a website, and also mailing list where you can sign in. And if you would like to become a member of European Association for Critical Animal Studies, you can just send us a short uh, bio, bio and uh, picture as written on the website. So if you're interested, just read the website and you will find every, every link which is here. Um, Next uh, Facebook group I would like to mention is Animal Studies Group. It's not connected with any organization. It's just generally for people, for academics who are interested in this field. And Institute for Critical Animal Studies from North America also has Facebook group and the website. You can connect with other people and other academics and slash activists. Uh, also, it's good to know the journals. Uh, of course, when you're a researcher and you publish something from the field animal studies, you don't have to uh, publish only in animal studies journals. It's even better to try to uh, get accepted in mainstream journals. And there are a lot of uh, mainstream journals who are very open to these topics. For example, appetite, as you will see in a in a. Uh, resources of this uh, chapter that many of the articles I mentioned were, were published in Appetite. But it's also good to know these journals, especially because if you want to have some uh, overview of uh, what's happening in the field, it's, it's much easier to just grab this one or two uh, journals and go through them. So first, uh, the uh, is the Society and Animals Journal. It's uh, from started in 93, so it's a long tradition. Uh, second is Journal for Critical Animal Studies. That's maybe the only critical academic journal, so which, uh, which is advocating veganism, animal rights, and so on. So that's Journal for Critical Animal Studies. It's completely free online, so it's very um, it's easy to access. A uh, relatively new journal is called Humanimalia. It's, I would say, more, and Anthrozoos, and these two are more focused on uh, cultural anthropology, but uh, and not so critical, but also very interesting articles there. And the last thing I want to uh, tell you is website Faunalytics. And Faunalytics is, is not a journal, but it's organization which sometimes conduct research 
uh, but uh, especially it shares knowledge to help people help animals effectively. Yeah, so I especially recommend uh, to subscribe to their uh, research alerts to keep up to date with, you know, regular email summaries of new uh, research. So every week you will have in your email like four or five articles about animals, about uh, and not only about uh, farm animals and veganism, but also about uh, social animals, wild animals, and so on. Okay, so that that was everything. I was uh, quicker than I thought. So I hope you will have some questions. So here are the, my resources. I hope you will have this presentation available so we don't need to write them down now. And that's it. Thank you for your attention and feel free to ask questions. Okay, thank you, Teresa, for such an interesting and intriguing presentation. Uh, regarding the slides, uh, somebody also asked uh, whether they will be available or not. Maybe you can just post them into the Facebook event on CARE conference. You can just post okay. them there if, if you wish so, because there were a lot of uh, you know, interesting information and researches. So please, if, if, you, if you wish to just do that and we can yes. just go to yes, the question. Yes, I will definitely, definitely upload it. Okay, glad to hear that. Uh, okay, so that's the first question <laughs> there is. And the other questions are, okay, uh, I am doing some work in CAS and uh, HAR, but I'm still a master's student. Do you have any suggestions for journals that are open for student work publishing? I think that ICAS, uh, the Critical Animal Studies Journal, is open to student submission as well. I, I, uh, I noted there are some submissions like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you think these ideas should be taught also in curriculums for agriculture students, uh, slash zoology, zoology students, uh, etc.? Any tips for that? Yes, uh, definitely, because I think it gives a, a different perspective how to look at animals. Because natural scientists tend to look at, not always, but sometimes tend to look on animals as objects we need to measure, but uh, sometimes they're not trying to understand them or understand what they understand uh, what they mean for us, what's their status, what's our social construction, or what are our biases. Uh, you know, my dissertation thesis was about uh, lab workers who conduct experiments with animals, and uh, there I saw that although they usually consider themselves to be objective science scientists, they their work causing them to be biased toward animals. So uh, they are taught to see them more as objects and do not acknowledge their suffering so much as, for example, lay person would. Yeah, so, so I think it's very important for also for natural scientists to at least, you know, in some small course, it doesn't have to be big, but you know, some part of maybe some ethic or bioethic course, it would be, it would be great. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. Another question reads, uh, which areas do you believe require further research to achieve animal liber liberation? I believe uh, what at least what I'm trying to focus is the psychology of eating meat to actually understand why people are sticking to this practice, even though it's even against their own values. So how to help them to see this paradox and overcome that, that I think. And it also, there is a lot of new research in this area and I hope uh, there will be in the future. And I myself plan to do some experiments with uh, vegan meal and vegan meat and the prejudice toward them. Uh, so I hope when we reveal this information, people will, at least some people will acknowledge that uh, there is a lot of, um, prejudice stereotypes and that's not no need for them. <laughs> yes, I agree. Thank you. Uh, another question is, do you think something like animal studies could possibly be taught in school, school to kids? Yes, 
uh, I think in some very basic version, just to talk about our uh, constructing animals, like edible animals, inedible animals, why we <laughs> eat pigs, we love dogs, and how is it in other cultures? I think it would be it could be fruitful. Of course, not in like traumatizing way, but just to discuss open open discussion about these areas. Okay. Or about or about how to you know interact with even like dogs and cats in a respectable way. There are many areas in in, in this field, not only this uh, part I presented here. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question: Are there efforts to include animal suffering in economic theories, for example, through human preferences as negative externalities? or animals as separate agents? Yes, that's, that's a good idea, but I'm not an economist uh, to answer. Uh, yeah, but that's, uh, that's quite a good idea to add this to the calculation because we recognize it. So maybe it's our duty to not notice it and behave according to it. Mm -hmm. There is a question in the chat. Should I answer it? Uh, let me, which is the perspective of the veganism and uh, indigenous si situation? Sorry, again? I'm not sure uh, which, it, it's, it was written by Gabriela Cuba, which is the perspective or what is the perspective of the veganism and indi indigenous situation maybe? Ah, like uh, indigenous people who cannot, for example, be vegans because of the environment, like Inuits and so on. Yeah, I think, you know, the definition of veganism is about what is practicable, you know, the, the official definition of uh, vegan society. So it's uh, aimed to exclude all animal using so far as it's practically possible. Yeah, so I think it's... Uh, uh, when people really are somewhere where they have no other options, then it's uh, ethical to, to do that because ethic is only possible when there is a, a possible of choice or when there's free, free will. Of course, we can say that they can move somewhere away. <laughs> That's what I would recommend in the long term, but uh, I know it's, I would say like, it's about choice. And also I have a secret or private message from one participant, if I can answer that on the chat. So how sure. do yeah, how do vegans deal with the ethical concern of feeding our companions animals non-vegan food? For example, cats must eat meat and buying their food contributes to animal suffering. Yeah, so uh, that's a tough question. Uh, some uh, vegans uh, uh, solve it by buying uh, plant-based, uh, special create meal where they have taurine and everything so they can be fed on this vegan diet. But I know about some animals which are not able to do that. Or yeah, I know it's much, much more easier for dogs, but I know about some cats for which it was difficult. So I would say it's again, it's about choice. If we don't have a choice, then we, you know, we could, we could kill the cat, but I, uh, there's also, you know, our personal relationship with them. And yeah. Well, I would, I think vegans should not buy these animals and since they're already there in shelters. Yeah, it's a question. Okay, uh, the next question is, what findings have you found most surprising or contrary to the common sense of, or intuition? Uh -huh. Contrary to intuition. Or most surprising? Well, uh, for example, I was surprised when I learned about the relationship uh, of uh, of hunters and gatherers toward wild animals. I always, I always thought that uh, storm here. Um, I, I, already, I always thought that they were cruel to animals. You know, these cruel hunters, and then they, they, they uh, cultivated our relationship toward animals. 
but I saw some many anthropology studies which show that they actually felt much more respect toward these animals, that they are more equal, they were perceived more like other nations than some sub humans which we can use, and that this hierarchy and feeling of superiority toward animals actually started mostly with domestication and with agriculture. And what was also surprising that human slavery was also closely connected to domestication. The domestication, this way of thinking about other animals allows people to accept that also other humans can be used in for our purposes. So that was something which is surprised me. Okay, thank you. I think we have uh, time for one more question, if you can do it in two minutes, or maybe more. Uh, what do you think uh, is the earliest age for a child to start sharing the truth with it that the uh, hamburger is actually a cow? This is only an example. Well, I think that uh, for learning about that meat is animal, I would say around four or five, when they actually start to understand other being, that other being can be hurt. Um, and but to see actually footages, I would wait till, I don't know, eight, nine. And only if they want to know because it can traumatize them. And uh, would you say that hunting is more ethical than factory farming? Yes, definitely, because the animals are free until and they can live with their families, they can have their babies and I wouldn't say it's ethical, but if I need to compare them, then factory farming, it takes all the freedom and it takes all the life of animals because animals are killed right after, you know, even when they are still uh, very young, they are not even adults when they are on the slaughterhouse. So they have any chance to live at all, to take care of their babies, to have sexual life, for example. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.